today we have uh, we are bringing you a filmmaker from the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival here in Missoula. We're so excited that he's here. This is Jason Jacks, and I'm going to turn the time over to Jason. Welcome, Jason. Hi, everybody. How are we doing today? They can do thumbs up. Oh, good. Okay. Thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Great. Okay. Well, it's so excited to be here with you guys today. And uh, I believe you guys are about to watch a, uh, a film that I produced. Is that correct? So are we playing the... Oh, great. Okay. And so are they uh, live streaming it then right now? They're, they're live, yeah. Oh, right. Well, we're going to show it. We'll the show computer. it. Okay. So, well, yeah. Why don't you give them a little bit of history about yourself and how you came to make this film, and then we'll show them a, the clip. Great. Okay. So everybody, give me a thumbs up if you've heard of National Geographic. Everybody's heard of National Geographic. Okay. So I work sometimes for National Geographic as a filmmaker. That means I get to go travel to places all over the world and make movies so that they can be shown at film festivals and on TV for National Geographic. And the movie you're about to see is from a uh, from a production that I did a couple well about a year and a half ago where I went to southern Mexico to find uh, to work with a biologist does everybody know what a biologist is thumbs up if you know what a biologist is okay so a biologist right is a scientist who works on uh, works with um, living things and so I worked with a biologist who studies giant carnivorous bats so bats, has anybody seen a bat before? Thumbs up. Okay, so most of the bats that you guys have probably seen are probably pretty little. But the bats that live in Mexico are really, really big. So I was lucky enough to be able to go to southern Mexico to work with a photographer as well as a biologist as they looked, for, looked in the forest for these giant bats. So that's kind of how I got started with this project, and I've been making movies since I was about your guys' age, with, you know, getting a camera together and getting my friends together and making, uh, you know, making movies together. So I've been able to do that and turn that into, uh, turn that into how I make a living. So with that, I think it'd be really cool to share this movie about giant bats with you guys. Okay, I'm going to uh, escape out of this PowerPoint and we'll start the movie. Just a reminder, students, that we can see you. Um, and so being respectful listeners is always great. Um, and we will get started with that. Uh, let me pop that up. And do you, this is, okay, it must be on, there we go. Okay, there we go. Um, and let's see if we can get it big. There we go. Yeah. To an untrained eye, you see a rainforest. But someone who has a little bit of information of what, what's going on there, you can see the effects of humans all over the place. The Maya lived here, here for over 1,500 okay. years, sustaining densities that were. Okay, boys and girls, we're going to bring Jace, Jason uh, back on for just a second and let him talk a little bit more about making the film while this film buffers. So why don't you Great. come back on? Okay. Hi, everybody. So, has everybody heard of the Mayan civilization? Thumbs up if you know who the Maya were, are. Sometimes I see some thumbs up, but some thumbs down. So I'll start for the thumbs down. So the Maya were an ancient culture that lived in central Mexico. And so they built, uh, they lived almost a thousand years ago, and they built these amazing pyramids and structures, big structures in the forest. So the crazy thing is that these structures, like the one behind me here, are still there. They were built almost some 800 years ago, some 1,000 years ago, some even longer than that, and they're still standing. 
So for this project, it was really cool to be able to go into the forest because many of these places have been found and discovered by scientists, but some of them haven't. So we would be walking through the forest and then you would come up along a place just like this that would be, you know, kind of hidden away in the forest. So this is an archaeological site where the Maya actually uh, lived and they built this site almost a thousand years ago. So we were able to, uh, to go explore a lot of these ancient Mayan ruins all over the Yucatan Peninsula. And the reason is, is because some of these bats actually live inside temples just like this one. Which meant that for the whole time that we made the movie, I got to go and see these places in person and go explore them and go see if there were bats living inside of them which was really, really fun. There's not many opportunities to be able to go into, uh, to go to a place like southern Mexico and to be able to go see, uh, you know, actual archaeological ruins like that. So has anybody ever, um, has anybody ever been to Mexico? I heard in the last session that some people had. Some you, people have. You know, let's just go uh, through the, the schools a little bit and see if anybody's been to Mexico and also if anybody has a question um, on what, what has been talked about so far. So let's go to Rocky Boy first. Um, Rocky Boy, have any of your students been to Mexico or seen seen ruins like this before? And uh, also, do you have any questions so far? Go, Rocky Boy. I think we have one question. You want to stand up, Jojo? Um, do the Mayans, how, when did the Mayan civilization first start? When so when did the... Yep. Yeah, when did the Mayan civilization first start? That's a, that's a great question. And, I, you know, I actually don't have an exact answer for when archaeologists decided that the Mayans first started. But this kind of structure, like the one behind me, the one that I spent most time in, is from a period of the Maya civilization called the Classical Period. So, and that period started about a thousand years ago. So that's a long, long time. So about about a thousand years ago, but then um, but then this uh, this temple is about eight hundred years old. So uh, you know a very very long time. Great question. I'm going to let Rocky Boy have one more question since there's two classes in that room. Do you have another question, Rocky Boy? Can I stand up, nice and loud. How many, how many Mayan temples were you in here? How many Just Mayan temples did you film? How many Mayan runes did you film? Oh, how many Mayan runes did I film? Well, this one was the primary one, but we actually went back um, after this film was done. We went back to shoot more. So in the process of shooting more films for a, for a larger film project, uh, we've been now to about six. And of those six, this is the only one that's been discovered and described. The other five we're just out in the forest. Like you'd be walking through the forest and there'd be a, you know, there'd be a ruin with trees growing out of it that would be, hadn't, it wouldn't have been described, it wouldn't really be known so much by science. It was just known by the local people. So we got to see some really cool places that hadn't been, haven't really been described before. Um, and in total, I've been able to shoot in about six of them. That's a great question. Great. Let's go to Chinook, and there's two classes in Chinook, so I want to start in the class that is in the computer room. Um, so that class in Chinook, do you have a question? Anyone have a question? No. Raise your hand. About my answer to that. No, I guess no, class, no questions Not yet. Not so far. How about the other, the other Chinook class, the one that's not in the computer room? Go ahead. Um, Hannah? Um, how many um, people have you actually um, um, known about, or, like, talked to about the rooms in that part of the town? Uh, what was how many people have you actually talked to about the ruins in that part of the town? So in every little village we go, in towns that are sometimes big towns, sometimes little towns, we have a, we have a guide in each town. So, so far we've worked with about six different people in six different locations 
to go help us find these, uh, these ruins in different places. So without, without working with people from the local communities, we would never be able to find these places. But the people who live in the towns that we work in know that they're there. They know that they're out in the forest. So we've been able to work with about six different guides um, who will take us basically through their backyard or through places that are nearby to where they live and help show us, um, help show us the ruins and help us see uh, whether or not there are any bats that live inside. Great. Okay, let's go to Arrowhead for one question, and then we'll get to the movie. Come on. Never mind. I lost Do we have a question? <laughs> Any questions from you? No questions at all? No, no oh, questions. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and start the movie then, don't you think? Hopefully it's buffered now. Go, movie. <laughs> we love it when technology works, right? Yeah, right. There. Maybe? Is there something I'm not doing right? <laughs> One moment, please. Maybe that might have messed up the buffering. To an untrained eye, you see a rainforest. But someone who has a little bit of information of what was going on there, you can see the effects of humans all over the place. The Maya lived here for over 1,500 years, sustaining densities that were higher at some point than what we have today. Even when you see the forest that's somewhat pristine, it shows the Maya hand right there. The word for bat in Maya is zots, and zots permeates the whole Maya universe. Okay, we're going to try one more time to buffer a little bit, but um, go ahead, uh, Jason, why don't you come back on and talk a little bit about the bats? Okay, so who saw? So all of the bats that were in those previous shots, there's places, you know, there's different types of bats. I mean, bats live in almost every uh, ecosystem in the world. So there's places where there live, uh, where there um, are a lot of bats, and then there's places where there are very few bats. So where we just saw where the bats were flying in front of the moon like that. That's from a cave in southern Mexico where uh, three million bats live in one cave from a bunch of different species, but it's three million bats that all live in one cave. And every single night, right around the time that the sun sets, uh, the bats all come flying out of this cave and then they go through all the way throughout the forest nearby. And these types of bats eat bugs. Right, so they fly through the air at night, um, and right after the right after the sun goes down, they fly through the air and they eat bugs out of the out of the sky and off of plants and things, and that does us a whole lot of good actually because the bats help keep all the pests, all the little bugs that eat uh, the different types of food that we eat. The bats actually help eat all of those pests, which means that the crops that we grow, the crops that they grow in Mexico. 
uh, won't be affected by different types of bugs that also want to eat those same crops. So for instance, there is a, um, so for instance, in, part, in that part of Mexico, they grow a lot of corn. And so there's a, a couple of different types of bugs that will actually go out and eat the corn as it's growing. And one of the things that these three million bats do at this location is to go out and eat the bugs so that the bugs don't eat the corn. So really, we owe bats quite a bit for, uh, of, you know, we owe them quite a bit because they help us grow our food. And that's just one type of bat, the bats that eat bugs. There's another type of bats that help pollinate plants, which means that they will actually uh, eat nectar almost like a honeybee or like a hummingbird, and they will, move, uh, they will move pollen from one plant to another which is how plants, um, how plants regenerate, how, uh, how plants uh, can grow and grow in new places. So not only do bats eat the bugs that are pests for us um, and can harm our food sources, but they also help pollinate the same types of foods that, um, that we also like to eat. So it turns out that bats are actually, some people are, you know, can be kind of scared of bats, but bats actually do a whole lot of good for us. Now the bats that we're looking for down here in Mexico they don't eat bugs, they don't eat uh, fruit, they don't eat pollen, they are carnivores, which means that they eat other bats, and they eat birds, and they eat rodents. They're very, very big. They're uh, about, you guys can see on the screen here, they're about this big. They're the size of a hawk, which makes them a top predator, it makes them the apex predator in their ecosystem. So the bats that we're looking for are very, very rare, and they don't live in big colonies like that. But hopefully you guys can see that in the video, and we'll try playing it again. Let's here. try it. <laughs> the word for bat in my day is zots. And zots permeate the whole Maya universe. My name is Rodrigo Medellin, and I'm a professor at the University of Mexico in the Institute of Ecology. Bats live in pretty much every ecosystem in the world. They're incredibly diverse. Every bat does a different kind of job. And you can see that just by looking at their faces and their structure of the wings and the structure of the whole body. Forty-six years ago was when I first had a bat in my hand. For many years, I've been documenting the ecosystem services provided by bats all over Mexico. But in the back of my mind, I had always had this dream of working with two of the most spectacular species of bats in the world. These bats are very rare. They're the biggest in this continent. They're the apex predators. They are the jaguars of the bat world. All we know, really, was studied in the 60s compared to many other species of bats that we know about. They're ab absolutely unknown, full of mysteries. Finding roosts is a major, major conundrum for anybody working on bats. The researchers were able to find a couple of fantastic roosts of false vampire bats, which provides an awesome opportunity to get some of the first pictures of these species in their natural habitat. My name is Anand Varma. I'm a photographer for National Geographic magazine. The greater false vampire bat roosts in these trees in a cavity inside a hollow tree. It's the first known roost of the species in the country 
So I climbed this tree and I put a camera trap. And so, so that's going to photograph the bats as they leave their roost every night. It's a little soggy. When I first got here, I thought, wow, this is, this is going to be easy. This is straightforward. There's a tree, the bats live in it. It's not that far off the ground. Got some pictures. Um, didn't quite nail it. They're never quite in the right spot. But the trigger's working. There's a bunch of bats leaving. I thought, done. You know, we're going to get some amazing images. Like many things, <laughs> this project has uh, hit some snags. And I found out three days into working on this tree that I'm allergic to it. I ended up in the emergency room with an infected rash. It's like, okay, first of all, I'm going to need to be a little bit more careful with that. <laughs> what are you going to do? The camera's already up there, so. So luck, no bats. No, no bats? They're not there? No bats. I guess we can try and see if we can find them there. Yeah, I guess they must be switching back and forth. And uh, That's one of the big mysteries about these things. We don't know how reliably they're, they're using a particular roost. Uh, and that's why we want to uh, put some radios on them to follow them around. But we know that there's this other roost, at least, at least a second roost. So uh, we have to find out. This is one of the least known uh, Mayan archaeological sites. Uh, it turns out that it's got a, a couple of rooms in there. And we found a colony of a bat that is really rare. It is threatened under the Mexican legislation and it's one of the first species to disappear once you disturb the rainforest. Wow. I've only been a handful of times inside a Wally Falls vampire roost. They're really powerful animals, carnivorous bats. Seeing those bats happening into them is an incredible experience. Very little has been done to study these bats, either in captivity or in the wild, and so we're just getting started at trying to see what we can do to document these animals and what we can do to understand these animals. What I was really excited about with this project is the prospect of being able to, to lend my expertise in photography to help the research that Rodrigo is doing here in Mexico. I brought a number of infrared cameras and triggers and that's going to help us photograph them in the wild in their natural habitat without disturbing them as well as trying to capture some of their behavior and some of their movement. species is incredible. It's, they live in these family groups and so it's really cool to be able to come here, here and try to help understand the basic biology of these creatures that are incredibly charismatic and we just don't know very much about them. And bats tend to get kind of a bad reputation. There's these kind of almost mythical creatures that you can hear as they whoosh by you at night, but you can rarely see them. 
what I want to do with my photography is do justice to these mysterious creatures of the night. This is why I'm a photographer. Be able to come to a new place in the world, see an incredible species in its natural environment, even though it's secreting this you know, toxic resin. To be able to climb this thing and then to be able to review pictures and see how they're moving through that's the night. I mean, that's the just, piece that's of cool. The tip of a wing is coming out like that. That seems that one seems to have taken off above further above mm. than the other. Yeah. It's, it just feels like the cutting edge of this exploration of the species, of the natural history, and be able to contribute something to the research of these animals, that's an incredibly rewarding aspect wow. of this work. They're all grooming. They spent a long time. That would be an amazing picture. All They're all heads in different angles, <laughs> wings yeah, in different exactly, angles. Yeah. This is the best time to be studying these bats. We have the technology. Other people, we have the population. To me, studying these two bats is a keystone to understanding the whole bat universe in the Maya world. Okay, boys and girls, that was amazing. I know it was uh, kind of stuttery, so I hope you uh, could see it okay. But um, let's turn the time over again to um, Jason, and we will get some questions. How about that? So from what you could see from the, um, the film, that's a pretty amazing film. Let's start with Rocky again, Rocky Boy. Um, and let's get some questions that you might have about, it could be about bats or it could be about filmmaking. Um, I think both of those topics are something we want to discuss. So Rocky Boy, let's get some questions from you. Hey, Jojo, you want to stand up? Nice and loud. When you make your film, um, how long, like, does it have to, wait, could you just make it like a couple minutes instead of a full hour? Or could you make it the length you want it? Oh yeah. So for this project, we made we made a little short version uh, so that it could play at film festivals, and then actually we're now producing a full hour about this same story for National Geographic Television. So this little movie is going to turn into a big movie, and uh, will be on TV uh, a little bit later this year. So, but for for this project, we wanted to keep it nice and nice and small. And so, uh, so it was just uh, just the photographer Anand and, and me uh, for this trip. And uh, so we kept the film very small, we kept the film crew very small, and we kept the movie short. But now we're going back and we're going to produce a full hour. So we'll get to do get to do more. About how long, Jason, did it take you to get that much footage? That ten minutes. Yeah. So this. For this trip, uh, this initial trip from which we edited this movie together, this trip uh, was of almost three weeks, about two and a half to three weeks. And we shot a lot of footage, uh, um, almost 10 hours worth of footage, uh, but then we edited that down and down and down, so it was only about 10 minutes. So, uh, so it was about a two and a half week trip, and now that we're going back for a longer piece, then we're going to spend a lot longer, uh, much, much longer down in Mexico to shoot a full hour's worth of television. Great. I see another hand up at Rocky Boy. Let's take another question. Stand up. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Nice and loud. How many places did you go in film? A little bit louder. How many... How many... How many places did you go and film stuff? How many places did you go to film everything? Yeah, so for, for the most part, for this film, most of the filming took place here at this archaeological site. This is a, 
a Mayan ruin called El Hormiguero. Uh, and so most of the filming was here. But in the film, we went to, uh, to get other shots. We went to about a dozen other places. So this was the primary place, but in total, we went to 13 or 14 different locations to shoot uh, different, you know, different scenes. Great. Good questions, Rocky Boy. Let's go to Chinook and start again with the computer room classroom. Um, do you have questions about bats or about filmmaking? Either one. Go, Chinook. Um, have you found any other animals in the jungle when you were looking for bats? Yeah, did we see other animals in the jungle? So we saw a lot of birds. Uh, we saw wild, um, wild boars, which the Mexicans called peccaries, uh, so like wild pigs. Uh, we saw monkeys. Uh, the thing that I really wanted to see that I haven't seen yet is a jaguar, but we heard them at night. We heard them, uh, they kind of roar at night. So we heard them, but we didn't see them. So, but there's a lot of wildlife in Mexico, and especially in this part of Mexico. So we did see a lot of other wild animals while we were looking for bats. Great. I see quite a few hands up in that in that computer classroom. Let's go ahead and take another question from you guys. How long have you been making movies? I've been making movies since I was probably about your age. When I was uh, when I started making movies um, with uh, Legos. Does everybody know Legos? Oh. Yeah, those? yeah. So when I was a little when I was uh, a little kid, an elementary school kid, I made movies with Legos, and I liked it so much that I just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And now, now I get to work for organizations like National Geographic. So, so, so what was your favorite Lego movie? Oh, I actually made? haven't seen the Lego movies. I no, think they, no, but the one you made. The ones that I made. Oh, yeah. the Star Wars one, of course. <laughs> So. Mr. Martin, I think you have a friend. <laughs> um, okay, let's go to the other Chinook classroom for some questions. About Riley? Um, were any of the bats really aggressive? Yeah, you were would think they would be because you would think that the bats would be aggressive because they have very large teeth um, and they use those teeth to hunt their prey. But when we, uh, so we captured several of them and we actually kept one of them in our hotel room with us uh, for about five days so that we could take pictures of it at night. And that bat actually was pretty, pretty calm. Once it got used to its surroundings um, and we would feed it and give it water, uh, then, then it was, it was okay. You know, then it was, um, it was much more calm and it would fly for us. Uh, and then we put it back in the wild after we were done. And so uh, the bats were actually far more calm than, than I would have thought, considering how big they are and how big their teeth are. So pretty, pretty calm. What did you feed the bat in your hotel room? <laughs> uh, well, the first time we fed them chicken, uh, little pieces of chicken. Uh, and then the second time we actually helped conduct, an, uh, we helped to conduct an experiment where we fed the bats uh, lab mice. Okay. So let's take one more question from that Chinook classroom. Um, how many films have you made? Okay, a little bit louder. How many films have you made? Oh, how many films have I made? That's a good question. Uh, let's see. In the last three or four years, um, about five about five short films and uh and now this this television piece will this television hour will be my sixth in the last you know three or four years but in total i have i don't even know i haven't counted them all up a lot great okay let's go to arrowhead and see if they have a question or two um eva um oh, just a um, are the name of the bats just carnivore bats, or do they have an actual name? A really good question. So there's two species of bats. One is called the greater false vampire bat, and that's Vampirum spectrum is its, uh, is its scientific name. So there's the Vampirum spectrum, that's also the greater false vampire bat, and then Cretopterus aurelius is the smaller bat, the bat that you see the most close-ups of. And that bat is called the woolly false vampire bat because you saw it's very, very fuzzy. 
it's very furry. And so they call it the woolly false vampire bat. And that scientific name is Crotopterus aurelis. Okay, one more question from Arrowhead. What town did you stay in when you went to Mexico? What, where did we stay? What town? Oh, what town? Uh, we stayed in a village, a very tiny village, um, very close to the border with Guatemala. And that village is called Castellat. So it's fun. It's uh, the closest city probably that it's uh, that you guys might recognize is Cancun, but it's about an eight-hour drive from Cancun. Uh, a little less, but it's like a seven-hour drive from Cancun. So it's it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. But the the little place we stay is called Castilla. Great. Um, I have a question. Um, what's the hardest thing about making films? Oh, the hardest thing about making films, I think. Hmm. That's a great question. I think it's getting together a team. Uh, it's bringing a team together and finding, you know, finding really good people to work with. Because making movies is is really hard. Uh, it takes a lot of people doing a lot of different things. So I think the the hardest uh, the hardest part for me about making films is, you know, trying to get the right people in the right place at the right time to help you to tell the story that you want to tell. How about the difference between why documentary films? Let's ask that. Why documentary films? Sure. So when I was when I was younger, when I first started making movies with Legos, like I was talking about, I really wanted to work on Hollywood movies, like movies that we all go to the movie theater and uh, and sit down and watch. But uh, in high school, when I was a little bit older than you guys are, um, I got a job at a TV news station. And when I was working in the news, I really liked what I uh, what I was doing because I got to go out and meet real people doing real things and I had the ability um, the it, basically it was my job to go meet people that otherwise you wouldn't have a reason to go meet so have you guys have all heard the phrase uh, truth is stranger than fiction <laughs> so it's like the uh, that's a that's a phrase right and it's and it's true it's that uh, that the real world out there the big wide world out there is crazier than anybody could ever write it and so I switched from making fiction movies making movies that were written by somebody to going out and actually seeing what happens out in the world to making documentary films and that was a lot of fun for me great and so that brings up a challenge right now that I'm gonna turn over to the the schools I'm going to give you one minute to turn and talk to each other about what documentary film subjects or topics would be something you would be interested in that you could maybe do around your school or around your town. So turn and talk for a minute and then I'm going to start uh, calling on schools and let's get some ideas from you for documentary films in your area. Go. One or two minutes. Talk to each other. All right, we're going to go ahead and start with Arrowhead because those are the ones I can see right now. Um, Arrowhead, did you guys have any ideas about what you might want to do? Um, there's a lot of things where you are, I know, that would be fun topics. Let's hear a couple. Um, animals. Like animal and animals yeah. around you guys, especially. Bears. Bobcats. Bobcats. Out in here. Yeah, you guys are right outside Yellowstone Park, so I think you'd have great animal subjects. Uh, let's take another topic or two from Arrowhead. <clears throat> Ranching. Ranching. Interesting. Ranch. That that would be good. How many of you live on a ranch? Yep. So you could start your film today, couldn't you? All right, let's go to Rocky Boy and hear from a couple of ideas from them. Rocky Boy, do you have ideas on documentary films in your area? Please go ahead and stand up. Nice and loud, okay? Their culture. Uh, their culture. Chippewa Creek. 
Chippewa Cree tribe. Okay, interesting. What in particular might be interesting for a documentary film about Chippewa Cree? Okay, TC, you want to stand up and share? Our language. The language. Very excellent. That would be a great topic. Any other ideas at Rocky Boy for a documentary film? Uh, Jojo, you want to stand up? Um, what we do and how we hunt. Hunting. Okay. Tell me, tell me a little bit more. What, what, um, what might be the main subject about how you hunt? We, we used to use bows and arrows. Right. So maybe so the difference between how it used to be and how it is now? That might be interesting. How about one more idea from Rocky Boy? Uh, Julissa? Traditions. Traditions. Excellent. Excellent. Um, great. Let's hear from uh, Chinook um, in the computer room. How about you guys in Chinook? Um, the Bear Paw Battlefield. Oh, tell me a little bit about the Bear Paw Battlefield. What went on there? <laughs> Oh, no, that's why we need the documentary. <laughs> Where do you want to share about the battlefield? Uh, no. Who can tell the history of the battlefield? Great, great. Um, how, how about another idea in that room? Does somebody have another idea? Our sugar beet festival. Oh, wow, the sugar beet festival. I think Chinook, isn't your mascot, mascot the whirling beets? Oh, yeah. Well, sugar, 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 all sugar. those sugar beets. Okay, the whirling sugar beets. Okay, let's go to the next Chinook classroom, the other Chinook classroom, and see what they say. Say loud. Um, farming. 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 Good. Okay. Crafting. The Bear Paw Mountains. The Bear Paw Mountains. Okay, there's lots of hands, so let's take one more from you guys. Um, Maryland school. The school's here. Okay. Yes. We have one life, in, life in a rural school. That sounds great. Okay. Um, Jason, I'm wondering, it sounds like we've got a lot of budding filmmakers. Yeah. What does. advice might you give this group of students now that have heard you talk? How would you get started? Uh, I think the, the great thing about today uh, is that almost everybody has access to a camera even if it's just on a cell phone. And I know some, not everybody has a cell phone, but I bet a lot of you guys have older brothers and sisters, or maybe your parents have cell phones, and cell phones have video cameras on them. So it's possible to start shooting video with a cell phone, which was much different than when I was growing up. Cameras were a little harder to come by. So I think the best advice that I have for, uh, for young filmmakers who want to start making their own movies is to get a camera and to start shooting. That sounds great. Okay, um, I think we're going to go ahead and take one more question from each class and then we'll wrap it up. So I'm looking at the Chinook classroom um, that's a regular classroom. Do you guys have one final question? Um, Julia. How did you get into making films? How did I get into making films? Well, I made, I've made a lot of movies, and I, made, I started making movies when I was uh, really small, when I was about a third grader. And so I just kept making them and kept making them, and I, just, uh, I found ways of continuing to make films through middle school, through high school, and then after high school, I found uh, jobs making, uh, helping to make movies or making news, uh, actually filming news. And so it's something that I've just kind of kept following for a very long time. Good question. Okay, let's go to one more question in the computer room at Chinook. One more. How long do bats live? 
a really good question. Uh, so there's all kinds of different species of bats, and some live for only a couple of years. But we think that these bats, now the thing is, is that we don't really know the, how old the bats in the movie actually get. But they believe that they can get up to 9 or 10 or 11 years old, which is pretty old for a bat. Wow. Thank you, Chinook. Okay, let's go to Arrowhead for one last question. So, Rosemary, go ahead. Um, how, how many people were on your crew? Of That's a good movies? question. So, for, for this project, there was just two of us. There was a photographer who was taking all the still pictures with all his equipment, and then there was me, and I was making the movie. So I was the cameraman and the director in the field. But now when we go back, we'll have, we'll have more people there to help with us. But for, for producing the short film, for going there for this trip, there was only two of us. Great. Okay, let's go to Rocky Boy for uh, one final question. All right, Cecia, you wanna stand up nice and loud? What was your favorite film? Uh, favorite what's film my favorite film? Oh, that's a hard question. Uh, let's see here. I think my, I have a favorite documentary film, um, and that's probably Man on Wire, which was about a man who, uh, a guy who actually walked on a line between the World Trade Center towers. And it's a really good documentary. Um, so I really like that one, but that's a, that's a hard question to answer. There's a lot of really great films out there. And we'll take one more from Rocky Boy since there's two classes in there. Teague, Teague, you want to stand up? Um, nice and loud. The bat class you had, was it like the biggest or smaller than the ones that you've seen? Were they bigger? Uh, yeah, so those two bats in the movie are the largest bats in all of the Americas, in North America, in South America, in the whole Western Hemisphere, those are the biggest bats around. There's one species of bat in Asia that's bigger, that's real, real big. It's called a flying fox. But the flying foxes eat fruit. They don't eat other bats or birds or they're not carnivores, they eat fruit. So these are the largest carnivorous bats in the world and then they're also the largest bats in, in our hemisphere. Great. Um, do you have any final parting words of wisdom for us? Any final parting words of wisdom? Well, it's great to connect with all of you, and it sounded like you guys have some great ideas for some documentary films. So hopefully, not too long from now, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be sitting watching your guys' films. So. That, that would be wonderful. And if any of you students want to draw some pictures of bats, and take a photo of them and email them to us. We'll pay, pass those along to Jason. I think that would be fun to see um, what some of the things are that you remember from the video. So let's everybody give Jason a round of applause and thank him for coming. Thank you guys very much.